You stupid bitch. Yeah, you're a stupid bitch. You stupid bitch. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Stupid <laughs> Bitches Say What? The Aussie podcast about everything and nothing, but always with wine. And your hosts, Skyly Collett and Sean Hipkins. This week it's true crime and we're stopping in the merry old land of England. Core, governor. Core. <laughs> fucking... Anyway, strap yourselves in as we recount some truly terrible crimes that took place in the land of the crown. Yeah. Sean covers the devastating investigation of the Sower murders, the case of two missing 10-year-old best friends that ends in tragedy. Ooh, uh, while, I car- <laughs> while I cover Sharon Carr, a.k.a. the Devil's Daughter, Britain's youngest female murderer. Jolly Roger. What you drinking, Sean, being a hipkin? Well, you stupid bitch. This has been a long time in the making for his birth. We shall wanted we? to, um, yes, we shall. So, in vivo, <laughs> you finish it off. Suddenly, SJP, also Sarah known as Jessica Parker, Savignon Blanc, please. It's a 2021 bottle. <laughs> it is a 2021, it's not a 2022, it's a 2021. No, so we've been talking about we wanted to sample SJP's wines together multiple times throughout season this is the season finale really isn't it it is yeah it's our official (laughs) season finale of season four but i think we wanted to do this back in season three or season we did we had big plans big plans but then we found out it's also a low alcohol option yeah boo boo Boo. stupid bitch also um total disclosure i have drunk it before wasn't a huge fan but i'm going to give it another shot also um this was $13 at the first choice. That's reasonable. The first time I looked at it, it was $20. Um, when I actually brought it for the first time, I got it for $15, but they've dropped it down to $13, I think, because it's so shit. Mm, well, it's not, well, from my personal taste test just had then, it's not shit. Like, it's drinkable. It just tastes like apple juice. You can taste the severe lack of alcohol yes. in it, can't you? It's yeah. like... It's like everything that we're against. It's almost like drinking no alcohol wine. Water wine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me have a go. Hang on. Just, just let me prepare the palate. Cut her up, darling. Okay, here we go. Here we go. First drink of the night. Excuse me, where's the booze? I know. It just tastes like watered down wine, watered down mm. apple juice. Yeah. So that is the reason why we weren't too enthusiastic about drinking it, because as you know, dear listeners, mm-hmm. we do like to get pissed whilst podcasting. And, and look, SJP, SJP is almost a third member of this podcast in some ways, isn't she? Because she does feature a little bit from time she to time. She does, but now I feel so, like Samantha to her, what's her name? Carrie. You were totally judging after her drinking, for a wine. After drinking that wine, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going down great for me, but I just also ate my dinner. Yeah, it's not terrible. It's just not good. Mm. <laughs> and on a Friday afternoon, I after a good. long fucking week, we want something good, don't good. we? We're like, yeah. Burr, burr, burr. Yes, but we do like to try and keep somewhat sober during our true crime ones. So, so this will certainly do that, won't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I Take. feel like I'm going to be well hydrated after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they put a dash of soda in it. Oh, actually, I might even put a dash of fucking vodka or something in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And then you spew. <laughs> and then I vomit. Um, how's your week been, please? <gasps> Look, I have a truly funny tale to tell. You're going to be in stitches in a few moments. Oh, God. So there was many things that have happened this week that I could have shared with our listeners this evening, but I, I picked I picked something that occurred this morning. Um, as you know, I like walking my dog in the early hours of the morning and lately it's getting quite warm in the morning. So I have to go super early and usually it's just me. My dog's a bit of a psycho. He's still a baby. He's not quite two yet. 
Um, so it's very oh, jumpy. Yeah. No, it'll be two on Boxing Day. He was born oh. Boxing Day two years ago. Yes, yes. Um, I adore him to death, but he's he's social in the, like, I, I, I want to say he's not a people person, which is actually not true. He is a people person, but he just wants to kill you with kindness. Like he wants to <laughs> lick you and jump on you and get in your lap. And he's a huge, giant, half husky, half red cattle dog. Um, so it's, it's very just, outgoing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly. <laughs> um, anyway, so he's like a bit difficult in the mornings to get ready. Like once he's walking and he's been walking for about 10 minutes, he chills out. But generally in the morning, even trying to get like his, his lead on him and his little brace that he wears under his chest and under his legs to sort of harness him, it's just such a nightmare to get him into it. He's just so excited. excited. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we go off on our morning walk and it's lovely. And so we had a few incidents with, with people walking their dogs where I had to literally reef him back. Um, would never hurt another dog, would just lick them to death and yeah. cry when he's trying to, but because he's quite big, people are, are afraid of him. So I have to sort of, you know, tug him back because people go, ah, don't bring him near my dog. Heel Cujo. <laughs> anyway, so walking, 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 um, and walking across a bit of a driveway. And my, it was just like a little bit of a slanted driveway. Oh, and my no. foot, my foot took a little bit of a turn at the ankle, and I went, "Oh!" Wow. Um, but just at that moment, my dog decided to pull. So <laughs> if I had just turned my ankle a slight amount, I would have caught myself and regained my balance. But he yanked on the lead at the same time, and I oh. went ass over, <laughs> face first, hands captured me, legs out from under, complete planking on someone's driveway <laughs> on the main road. Um, Did you hurt and- yourself? I hurt myself severely. I'll oh, get to no. that. There's more to the story, though. My dog, who is also quite a pussy, um, freaked out and thought, I think someone had pushed me over, like he thought someone was attacking me because I fell to the ground. He's so used to me on the ground like that. <laughs> so he started crying and whimpering, trying to protect me and, like, check that I was okay and running oh. circles around me whilst pulling the leash even tighter <laughs> and dragging me further and further <laughs> down the driveway. Whilst I was still stunned <laughs> from the whole fall and I was planked and he's dragging me and I'm sort of like doing these ones like a like a seal almost. A like fish out of water. <laughs> down someone's driveway. And it wasn't like the main, main road, Ricketts Road. It was the one that comes off it but goes down to all the estates so everyone's on their way to work and <laughs> cars driving past. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm sure that people were looking out of their windows or just about to leave their front door and went, oh, oh, look at this woman. Uh, <laughs> She's injured. When you witness a magpie attack, they're probably going, ha ha, look That's at that woman. Very similar scenario. Um, so I've taken a great big giant oh, chunk no. off the top of my finger. Like it was full, had a flap of skin oh. hanging off like flesh. Oh. All the tops of my fingers are like, it's blisters, like it's blisters because I got dragged along like a, a driveway almost. Right. Um, so this one copped the brunt of it, but all the other fingers, oh. like all the pads here are all like worn off. Yeah. His hand's got a big slice down it. A, a decent exfoliation. Taking me. There's a <laughs> massive chunk out of my knee. <laughs> oh my God, you stupid, poor, stupid bitch. I'm picturing, you know, when people are drunk and they go to dance and do the back spin, <laughs> like break dance and someone grabs their legs and spins them. I'm picturing something similar to that. Imagine but on your front, that, but on, on a gravel. front plank, <laughs> like a plank where my arms aren't supporting me up. My chin's almost, it's lucky I didn't graze my chin no. because that's how close I was to the ground with my dog jumping on me and crying. Like I literally had to console him and sit him down and give him long pats whilst like in the, the scene of the, of the accident without being able to just hurry along and just pretend like nothing happened because he was that beside himself because he thought I was injured. Well, I was. Um, but I think he thought something had attacked me. Yeah, someone he was had jumped out. So scared, I was like, spooked him as well. I was like, Patty, I was like, it's okay, mummy's fine. I'm okay. Look, I'm okay. Did See? anybody ask if you were okay? Or no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think any pedestrian people walking around saw what happened because um, I couldn't see it. Because that's the first thing you do when something like that happens. Uh, right? when who you, saw? You look, uh, 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 and you get wait for the. Well, you wait for the people to come up and be like, "Are you okay? Can I help you? Can I help you up?" You look. Oh, I'd rather just help myself, actually, because I'm so look away. embarrassed. Look away. <laughs> you can help me by <laughs> fucking off right now. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was delightful, and oh. I was about. 
halfway through my walk, which usually takes me about an hour, an hour and a 10 minutes. So I still had to walk and there was no shortcut I could take. I was like on the furthest point away from my house. So I had to walk all with my flapping skin and it was yeah. really windy this morning. So oh, no. my flap was going <laughs> with the wind. It was super windy this morning and today. It's gone cold again after yeah. the sweltering heat. We've gone back to fucking cool That's weather been, again. The weather's been lovely. I've been loving it. But um, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, and I thought of you and I didn't want to tell you about what happened because I was actually going to message you and be like, you're never going to believe what happened and show you my war wounds. But then I thought if I do that, the shock value of telling you tonight will be gone. So I was like, no, I'm going to savor it. I'm going to to sit on this all day in preparation. (laughs) Thank you very much. I do. I am glad you gave me the, um, the full, full story first on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you stupid bitch. How's your week been? Also, this wine is terrible. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I repeat, the wine is terrible. Thank like, fuck, I only paid $13 plus. Yeah, I got mine on special like about a month and a half ago now, I think. And I've still I got recall. her Prosecco to try and get through. I think the Prosecco was slightly like, I think I actually threw this one out. I drank a bit of it when I was drunk one night and just got it out. Um, and ended up throwing it out. Oh, when you're drunk, this ain't ever going to do the trick. No, you're going to be nah. like, I'd rather Fuck drink water, shit. mate. Yeah. <laughs> rather drink apple juice. <laughs> Um, my week's been good, you stupid bitch. We've um, we've got Dua Lipa tomorrow, so by the time we <gasps> do this episode, it'll be I did well not after know it was had... tomorrow. I mm. hate you so much. And I Look, could have brought tickets and I would have been in the perfect position right now to be going tomorrow night yes, with you. If I had got skin them. flap and all. We have... Um, yes. We did, and because we did ask you about it, but you were in the midst of still living in the Central Coast. I'm sure the borders hadn't happen. even officially opened yet, remember? This is true. They were but hedging we about the, whether they would. When Ticketek sent out the tickets last week, I think, you know, they wait until beforehand, mm. just before to send them. We actually booked them in September last year. That's how long ago it was. But, yeah, time's flown. So we're looking forward to seeing her. It's going to be great. We're going with, Vinny and I are going with Maria and taking little Heidi, 10-year-old Heidi, to her first concert. So it's going to be fun. She's going to love that. Yes, it's going to be good. Um, but we had a bit of an animal catastrophe, <laughs> had in the pan, um, a couple of nights ago. We had a the great cat escape. Linus Cream jumped over to the neighbor's balcony and we couldn't get her back. She just was there and she, even though there's a little gap between our balcony and theirs, what she'd done is she jumped on our banister from the fridge on the, you know, the glass thing and had gotten across that way. So we moved the pots and all that shit, unblocking the gap so she could get through. But she's put on a little bit of weight lately, I think. So she couldn't really sort of get up the urge to get through the neighbors weren't home so we even when we, we couldn't go in and get it through the balcony we're thinking what the fuck are we gonna do we're there for 45 minutes toys cat food come on come on trying to get her across she was just distressed meowing and all this stuff you could see she was distressed. Ah. so we know the person who lives on the other side of the balcony that ours connects to yeah so then he messaged him and said can you just stick your head out of the balcony it'll scare her and she might come through the gap. And it worked. She came over and she's like, oh, hello, darling. And Linus shut herself right into the gap and then was pushing herself through. But she had to get on her side, wriggle. It took about five seconds for her to get through. And I didn't want to oh, grab her. No. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to grab her and reef her because I thought she'd go back the other way. But fuck me, that bad cat. So, yes, the um, outside is out of bounds now and supervised. Again, it's about the 12th time we've enforced it. But yeah, so that was a bit distressing for us. But I did also oh my get my, gosh. I also got my Care Bear in the mail today, um, yesterday, which was great. Which is super cute. Um, you know, good, my cat, good luck bear. Yes, Swannies, Swatties from our um, dining room window down out onto, you know how the bus, my parents' bus that they're selling is parked next. So Swannies from there onto the bus, onto the ground. But he used to, at the old house, jump from the veranda down to the ground anyway. So he only really jumps on the bus because of convenience. Like it's he'll there. jump two stories. Like, Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, our, um, we are a bit petrified of one of them going over. We don't know if that's five from our height. Yeah, oh, totally. That's way too high. It's very scary. But are supposed to land on their feet, though. They are. Whether it breaks and cripples them, they still are meant to be on land on their feet. <laughs> <laughs>
<sighs> so who's going first tonight in our UK merry old English true crime special, a last stop? So who's going first this week, you stupid bitch? Do you want to lead us in our English soiree of murder? Sure, I'd love to. I'd love to. Thanks. Hello, Gavda. <laughs> so bad. I was actually trying to do an English accent, like trying to sort of try, but I'm terrible at accents, so I didn't even bother in that intro. Anyway. Uh, okay. So actually, I think mine will be reasonably short, to be honest. It's it's about two pages, yeah. Um, but have you heard of Sharon Carr? I don't think so. I did... Um look up when I was getting the little write-up together I had a look oh, but I may look as you tell the story it may reignite some memories from a true crime episode being the youngest female murderer in Britain I'm sure she's featured in a couple of TV specials yeah it's um it's quite shocking so uh sharon louise carr also referred to as the devil's daughter is britain's youngest female murderer she was just 12 years old Jesus. when she brutally stabbed 18 year old katie ratcliffe a stranger to her as she walked home from a nightclub in surrey in june of 1992 Jesus. Stabbing her more than 30 times. They're the scariest ones, aren't they? And, I mean, obviously all murder is scary, but when it's just random like that. It gets worse. Like, she's truly, you know, got some, got some messed up issues, yeah. Um, it took investigators over two years to determine Carr as a suspect, and that wow. was basically, and I'll get to this bit, because she had confessed and told people about it because she couldn't keep her mouth shut. Um, based on the placement of the body and the sexual mutilation, leading police to believe initially that a man Ooh. was responsible um, for the crime instead of a 12-year-old girl. That's how brutal it was. And, look, I could be jumping to assumptions and all that, but if it's sexually, if there's sexual mutation and shit like that, that girl's had a rough upbringing. Well, they'd, from my research, they do touch on it, um, but it's, you know, it's not a lot of information to be honest um yeah. so sharon carr was born in belize in 1981 and into poverty relocating to england at the age of five her parents separated shortly after with her mother remarrying um, and serious domestic violence being reported in the relationship her mother was once charged with assault after bore pouring boiling fat over her new partner causing him to be hospitalized jesus Despite this, Sharon's early teachers described her as polite, helpful and sociable, only occasionally showing bouts of aggression. Later, she became disruptive and attention-seeking, forcing the school to have social services intervene and placing her in foster care for a brief period, but she was eventually returned to her mother after about one month. On the 7th of June 1992, Carl randomly stabbed 18-year-old apprentice hairdresser Katie Ratcliffe to death as she walked home in the early hours from Ragamuffins Nightclub in Camberley. Oh, bitch. In total, Carl stabbed Ratcliffe, who was a stranger to her, 32 times with a six-and-a-half-inch knife through her ribs, in her heart and in her vagina and anus. Oh, God. Some of her, some of her jewellery was then stolen. Following the attack, Ratcliffe's body was taken by Carr and some associates. Now, there's not much I couldn't, like, find a lot. I knew you were going to probably ask about this, about who the associates were and what happened to them, but I can't find a lot of information. I'm sure it's there. but I And was... they're probably underage and there's all that whole legality of what information Absolutely. they can release. Yeah. And I was a little bit rushed in my preparation tonight for true crime <laughs> and memories. And so... do, do you know how to stuck a cat? Cup of stock going into a meatball. <laughs> yes, and many other things. Many other things this week. Um, so, so Ratcliffe's body was taken by car and some associates and driven to Fanborough, another neighbouring town, where she was dragged along a road and then dumped by a cemetery wall. The body was found later that morning by a group of boys. As I mentioned before, when police investigated the killing, they noted the brutality of the attack. Some of the knife blows that Ratcliffe had suffered had gone straight through her body. Body, her That's sexual a big knife. It's a big knife, yeah. 
her sexual organs had been mutilated um, and officers found that her clothes had been pulled up, but there was no sign of sexual assault. Due to the nature and severity of the injuries inflicted and the fact that the attack appeared to be sexually motivated, police believed the attacker to be a full-grown male. Yeah. In part because of this, the real killer went unidentified and the case went initially unsolved. So the stabbing of a classmate. So Carl wasn't apprehended for the murder um, of Ratcliffe and she returned to school but was suspected twice um, in early 1994. Two years to the day after Ratcliffe's murder on the 7th of June 1994, Carr attacked 13-year-old fellow pupil Anne-Marie Clifford with a knife for no apparent reason in the toilets at Collingwood College. Clifford was stabbed in the back, which punctured her lung, and she nearly died as a result of her injuries. The attack was only stopped when five students entered the toilets and intervened, which likely saved the victim's life. Clifford no. said that Carr was smiling and appeared happy during the attack on her. Yeah, she's messed up. She's Carr was, well. yeah, she's not well at all. Carr was quickly arrested and told officers that she enjoyed stabbing cats and had beheaded a dog. Oh my god! This was twelve. Yeah, she'd already like killed, killed a human. An, an adult, an eighteen-year-old adult, stabbed a classmate and killed a whole bunch of animals. So her initial imprisonment after her arrest for this is for what happened to the student, not what happened to the hairdresser. Yeah. Um, Car was sent to a medical assessment center where she tried to strangle two members of staff. She was charged with two counts of actual bodily harm for this, in addition to the charges for her attack on Clifford, the girl from school. She was convicted in December 1994 and sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. She was initially held in various psychiatric units but continued to regularly, seriously assault other females and so was transferred to an all-boys unit um, oh at Acliff Sec Secure Centre. Yeah. Um, in September 1995, she was transferred to Bullwood Hall Young Offenders Institution, where it was thought her aggression and sexualized behavior could be managed better. It sounds like she needs to be in solitary. Yeah. And you have to wonder about what level of meds they were giving her too. Yeah. Like, seems like she needed to be full medicated just to protect her from other people because that's how dangerous she was. Yeah. She's fucking, and at this point she was 14, mate. So soon after her transfer to Bullwood Hall, staff discovered that Carr was talking about the killing of Katie Ratcliffe, the hairdresser, to friends and family on the telephone and in her diary. She also admitted to attacking a prison officer who she said she had a crush on and talked about it to another probation officer. Staff alerted police and they seized her writings and drawings. Her diaries were found to contain detail of her sexual excitement at the thought of Ratcliffe's death and she also commented that she felt jealous of her victim and remarked about the devil and the forces which motivated her. And when it was interesting when you say like she attacked the person she had a crush on. She gets sexually excited when she's stabbing. So her, um, you know, what triggers her good things is terrible things. Yeah, you have to wonder what happened to her when she yes. was small, like, 100%, 100%. you know, because it has it has to come from somewhere, doesn't it, right? Usually, um, yeah. So Carr had written in her diary, I swear I was born to be a murderer, and in a letter to a friend wrote, I'm a killer, killing is my business and business is good. 14. She had also drawn pictures of the knife involved. Detectives questioned her on the murder and she confessed to the killing, admitting that she had repeatedly stabbed Ratcliffe. She graphically described one particular injury and provided details of which the police had deliberately withheld, meaning that she had knowledge that only the killer would have. She also knew that a bracelet had been stolen, which police had never revealed. She helped police film a reconstruction of the murder in which she acted out the murder and when questioned about the attack, repeatedly laughed about the details. Police found that Carr had a long history of cruelty to animals, having once decapitated a dog with a spade and concluded that she was probably suffering from a form of psychopathic disorder. Yeah, it's never a good sign when animals get fucked over as a child. 
No. I'll tell you what, though, um, in getting to this story, there was two other stories, and I'm not talking about that. I know what you're probably going to think, the Jamie Bolger one. Um, that's yeah. a horrific, horrific story. I wasn't going to um, do that either. But there was two others that led me to this story about young people in England um, mm. who've murdered small children and they've all been like 12, 13, like it's... Scary. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really yeah. full on. There's a couple of really, really horrible, horrible stories, but this one I picked because she was the youngest and also it's not as graphic as some of the other oh, thing, other the children. Jamie Bulger one, yeah. I looked at that too and I thought, no, nah, I can't do that. But there was a couple of others that were similar circumstances, unrelated, which were just truly awful. Mm. Um, so the murder trial, she was charged with the murder of Ratcliffe in May 1996. Um, on the 25th of March 1997, after a month-long trial, she was convicted of murder. The jury had deliberated for five hours before reaching a unanimous guilty verdict, choosing to convict her for murder and not manslaughter. Because, which why would it be manslaughter anyway? Because she From the admitted to it. it. Yeah, and she the confessed and the brutality. Yeah. Um, I guess because she was a child, maybe they were trying to give her a lenient sentence, but that didn't work out anyway. Agreed. The conviction meant the conviction meant that Carr was officially Britain's youngest ever female murderer, having only been twelve at the time of the killing. Um, and then Mary Bell it talks about was infamously convicted at age 11 of killing two boys in 1968, but she was convicted of manslaughter, not murder. That's a horrific story too. I read that one in coming to this one. It's awful. Um, when sentencing Carr, the judge remarked, what is clear is that you had a sexual motive for this killing and it's apparent both from the brutal manner in which you mutilated her body and chilling entries in your diary that killing, as you put it, turns you on. You are, in my view, an extremely dangerous young woman. Carr was smiling as she left the dock after the conviction. I was thinking that. She's probably sitting there thinking, I don't give a fuck, dude. Yeah. She received a minimum of 14 years imprisonment after her trial. Wow. So she got life, but with 14 years, you know, minimum probation, Jesus. good behaviour. Um, a criminal psychologist noted, the extremely unusual nature of the case saying this is a difficult case to understand one can find precedents of young children killing other young children but in this case it was a child killing someone who was almost an adult she was branded the devil's daughter in the press the media reported extensively on the historical conviction of such a young murder highlighting her obsession with death and violence Carr's case has been noted for being particularly unusual. Whilst female murders are themselves uncommon, females who kill strangers are even more unusual and the case of a 12-year-old girl killing an adult stranger has been described as unique. Yeah. Carr remains British, Britain's youngest female murderer. Jesus Christ. So um, two things. She's tried to appeal to get out and they yeah. continually don't let her out. Good. So she's in her 40s now. And I'd say um, her behaviour in prison isn't exemplary. No, she's just prone for violent outbursts, for attacking inmates, attacking guards, attacking, yeah. you know, specialists, whatever, um, and quite horribly. But she was also engaged um, to another murderer who was accused of murdering his parents, uh, Robbie Lane. So they were due to marry, um, but then they called it off. Apparently, oh, after hearing of each other's evil deeds. Oh, wow. Allegedly. Because they probably realised um, that bitch or that arsehole was going to kill me before I kill him or her. Well, they were never really going to get out. They were both on life sentences. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe they were allowed some visitation. Um, it must have been, do we ever figure out what the deal is with, like, co-ed prisons? Yeah, in the UK? That, I think Vinny said that he doesn't think that happens in, in Ireland. But Maybe they must allow not. day visits or something. They must allow some well, level of socialisation. Yeah, and I think, who's remember, the, they were on day release, so they probably go out as a group on day release or something, maybe. I don't know. So it says here... The wedding plans were thrown in the bin after Sharon read that Lane, Robbie Lane, the guy that he was going, she was going to marry, had gorged his mother's eyes out. 
Oh, God. Um, and it seems Lane was pretty disgusted by the sadistic murder carried out by his bride to be. <laughs> it's kind of rich, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, don't fucking judge me, arsehole. <laughs> they even brought the rings, which had to be sent back. Oh, no. <laughs> Hopefully they got store credit for it at least. <laughs> Or um, just chisels or something. <laughs> both were given life sentences, so arrangements were made for the chaplain to marry them in the chapel of the mm. prison or a shared prison, I guess. Yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> that is terrifying to think that a 12 year old was capable of that. And you'd hope to think as an 18 year old, like if you were that 18 year old, you'd be able to fend him off. But fuck. Well, it was her it's and a, a couple of night. friends. <laughs> so yeah. it wasn't just her on her own. And because they had a car, it tends to be, you tend to think that one of them was old enough to be driving. Yeah. So, um, and she, it also talked about her childhood. She was quite infatuated by older men um, or older teenage boys. So it might have been a couple of teenage boys that she was yeah. with that could easily sort of, you know, and shit. yeah, could take control of the situation on her behalf. And, mm. Maybe they freaked out when she did something and backed off, or but they helped take her car, take her up to the cemetery where they left her. Yeah, and she at had least a one knife anyway too, didn't she? Mm. No escaping that shit. Oh, that wine is gross. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I'm looking forward to getting through it this podcast just so I can drink something else. No, it's disgusting. All right, so strap yourself in. This one's a bit of a big one, um, but it's. The Sohan murders, but it really covers the investigation behind a lot of it because it's quite never heard of it. Um, I'd seen a, a special on it before, and when I was talking to Vinny, I'm like, which one should I do? I was looking at some big profile English cases like Dennis Nielsen and stuff like that, and I thought if you're doing those ones, you really have to get all the research right and shit mm, like that. Mm. Um, but this one, yeah, it's quite quite tragic and sad. He's but... saying your research is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And my research is flippant. Cut paste, cut paste, cut paste. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Wikipedia. So, or Murderpedia, if you will. Yes. At 11.45 a.m. on Sunday, the 4th of August, 2002, 10-year-old Jessica Chapman left her home to attend a barbecue at the home of her best friend, Holly Wells, also 10, in Soham. When she left, Jessica told her parents of her plans to give her friend a necklace engraved with the letter H that she'd pur purchased from her for her on a recent family holiday to Menorca. So they hadn't seen each other for two weeks, dead excited to catch up. That day, the girls listened to music and played computer games. And in the afternoon, both girls changed into some distinctive replica Manchester United football shirts. So those big red, bright red shirts. I'm familiar. Holly's mother took a photograph of the two friends before the children then ate dinner with the other house guests. House guests. They then returned to playing in Well's room just after 6pm. Shortly after that, the girls left the Well's residence without informing any of the house guests. Oh, no. To purchase sweets from a vending machine at the local sports centre. At 8pm, Nicola Wells, Holly's mum, entered her daughter's bedroom to invite the girls to say goodbye to the house guests, only to discover that they were both missing. Oh, my God. Alarmed, she and her husband, Kevin, searched the house in nearby streets. Minutes after their daughter's 8.30pm curfew had expired, Nicola phoned Jessica's home to ask if the girls were there, only to learn that Jessica's parents were also worried that their youngest daughter had not returned home. So she wasn't sleeping over. She was supposed to be home by 8.30. She was meant to head back home, yep. Following subsequent frantic efforts by the families of both girls to locate their daughters... They were reported missing by their parents at 9.55 p.m. Police launched an intensive search for the missing children. It ended up involving over 400 officers who conducted the house-to-house um, -house inquiries across Soham and also included hundreds of volunteers who assisted in the search. So you know, and you know who usually involves themselves in these searches, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It ended up being the biggest police hunt in England at the time, but there was also some criticism in the lack of attention the case received in the initial hours after the girls went missing, which is seen as the golden hours of an investigation. Like so where's Soham? Whereabouts is it? So it's about, it's north of London and it's about half an hour sort of out from Cambridge. Okay. The police released the photograph that Nicola Wells had taken of the children less than two hours before that the girls went missing wearing their Manchester United football shirts 
and the parents of both girls stated that their daughters had been wary of talking with strangers, having been warned not to trust people that they did not know from early childhood. So there was confidence they wouldn't have gone off with a stranger willingly. Mm. So suspecting the children had been kidnapped, investigators questioned every registered sex offender in Cambridgeshire and neighbouring Lincolnshire which included 15 high-risk pedophiles. Isn't it fucking scary knowing that there is high-risk pedophiles out there in the community? And you think they'll just have, like, constant surveillance on them or something? I don't know. Four days after they disappeared, so they've been missing for four days now, CCTV footage of the girls that was recorded minutes before their disappearance was released to the public. The footage depicted them arriving at the local sports centre at 6.30 to get their sweets and a televised reconstruction of the girls' last known movements was broadcast nationally and both sets of parents held um, interviews pleading for their children's return. So they sort of showed the photo, showed the CT- CCTV footage because they want um, intel now from the public. They're just Having something shirts. will trigger someone's memory. Exactly, yeah. They've got the big right red bright red shirts on together. Several members of the public reported having seen the children in the early days of the investigation, recognising the jerseys, and most of them provided, but most of them provided no leads. One person who claimed to have spoken with the girls immediately before their disappearance was 28-year-old Ian Huntley, who worked at, as the caretaker at the girls' school and was also dating Maxine Carr, who was a teaching assistant, teaching assistant at the school, who knew the girls well and had taught them in the previous year. Huntley and the area where the school is kind of like the community or the village where these the girls lived and the caretaker backs onto the school grounds. So it's all very close. Huntley informed investigators on the 5th of August, the day after the girls disappeared, that he had had a brief conversation with both girls on his doorstep the previous afternoon. According to Huntley, Jessica and Holly were both happy as Larry. Police were suspicious of his account and a single police officer searched his house on the 5th of August. No incriminating evidence was found, but the officer had noticed that numerous items of clothing on the washing line, just, um, there, there was numerous clo- numbers of, uh, blah, blah. but the officer had noticed that there was numerous items, items of clothing on the washing line, despite the fact it had been raining. In reference to the evident extensive cleaning of the house's interior, Huntley had stated, excuse the dining room, we had a flood. This officer was unconvinced by his claims and became suspicious suspicious of his agitated demeanour. In the weeks following the disappearances, Huntley reluctantly granted several television interviews to media outlets speaking of the general shock in the local community and his dismay at being the last person to see the children alive. By the second week of the children's disappearance, Huntley had become an unofficial unofficial spokesman for the community of Salem. His explanation for for this was that he wanted to convey to the media the frustration and despair the community was feeling. In one interview with Sky News, he claimed to be holding a glimmer of hope that the children would be found safe and well. And he said, and this is quotes, I don't know the girls. I was stood on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. They just came up and asked how Maxine was. And I just said she wasn't good as she hadn't got the job. And they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry. And off they walked in the direction of the library over there. Sorry for my shitty English accent. <laughs> but he does say. Is that just, what you were trying to do? I was that trying to do. Because he goes, they say, they just says, please tell her. His girlfriend was also interviewed by the press during the second week of the search for the children. In this live interview, she she corroborated Huntley's claims to have conversed with the children on their doorstep as she had been bathing before both girls had walked away from their doorstep, adding, I only wish we had asked them what they were doing. If only we knew then what we know now, then we could have stopped them or done something about it. Oh, they're both in on it, aren't they? Maxine then stated that the child had expressed her desire to be a bridesmaid at her future wedding. So they were so they were close, all right? She knew the kids well. Maxine also displayed a thank you card to this reporter, which had recently be, been given to her by Holly on the last day of the school year, saying, and this is what Maxine was saying, she was just lovely, really lovely before making a direct appeal to the children, just get on the phone and just come home. Or if somebody's got them, just let them go. It didn't go unnoticed by the media that she had referred about Holly in the past tense. 
she was just lovely, just lovely. And the girls hadn't been found at this stage. Mm, mm. Maxine then, uh, having participated in the search for the children, Huntley regularly asked police officer questions, such as how their investigation was progressing and how long DNA evidence could survive before deteriorating. One of these officers observed three vertical scratches on his left jaw, each measuring, measuring approximately three centimetres, which he claimed had been recently inf inflicted by his dog. On the 16th of August, 12 days after the girl's disappearance, Huntley and Maxine were first questioned formally by police. Both were questioned for approximately seven hours and provided witness statements before being placed with family members. Police had also received information from several residents who had recognised Huntley on the TV um, interviews that he had given and recalled that he had been accused of rape several years earlier. Others said, also said, that contrary to her televised yeah. claims, Maxine had been socialising in Grimsby Town Centre, which is a fair way away from Soham, um, on the night of the girl's disappearance, and that she was not at home in Soham, as she'd claimed in the media. She said she was in the bath, didn't she? Mm. So the same evening, police conducted a thorough search of, with the same evening that they'd, after they'd questioned her and put them with their families, <laughs> Um, the police conducted a thorough search of both Huntley's residence and the grounds of the Soham Village College, the school, where Huntley had worked as a senior caretaker as the couple remained under police watch at se separate locations outside of Soham. Each room of Huntley's home had evidently been recently and meticulous, meticulously cleaned, and the search of the home revealed many items of major importance to the investigation. The evidence and artefacts were not made public at the time, but the items recovered from the school grounds included items of clothing the girl had been, girls had been wearing when last seen. Their charred and cut Manchester United shirts were recovered from a bin in a hangar at a place at Hunt Huntley's work. Fibres recovered from these gar garments were a precise match to samples received, retrieved from Huntley's body and clothing, as well as from his home, and his fingerprints were also recovered from the bin. Oh. Huntley's car was also forensically examined, which revealed that the car had been recently extensively cleaned and traces of a mixture of brick, dust, chalk and concrete were found in the car. A cover from the rear seat was missing and the lining of the boot had been recently removed and replaced with ill-fitting section of household carpet. Having discovered the children's clothing at the school, police decided to arrest Huntley and Carr. So at about 12.30 p.m. on the 17th of August, um, 13 days after the disappearance and the day after the searches of the Huntley's residence and workplace, a game gameskeeper discovered the bodies of the girls lying side by side in a five-foot irrigation ditch, more than 10 miles east of Selham. He immediately reported the discovery. But not at the school? No, ten, so 10 miles east of um, the Selham. He immediately reported the discoveries to the police and when their bodies were found, their corpses were in, in an advanced state of decomposition. In an apparent effort to destroy forensic evidence, the murderer or murderers had attempted to burn both bodies. Despite this, investigators rapidly deduced who the two victims were most likely who, who the two victims most likely were, yeah. and that they had not died at <clears throat> the location of their discovery. During initial questioning, Huntley refused to answer any questions and appeared evasive, confused and emotionally detached, often drooling during, police's, during the police's attempts to question him in an effort to feign mental illness. This left police with no option but to refer Huntley to a mental hospital to undergo an extensive psychological evaluation. Maxine, however, quickly confessed to detectives that she had lied about her whereabouts and her partner's actions on the 4th of August. Shortly before she had returned to Soham from Grimsby, three days later, Huntley had claimed to her in a phone call to have seen the girls shortly before they dis their disappearance, admitting, the thing is, Maxine, they came in our house. According to her, Huntley then informed her the children had entered their home in order that Holly could stanch her nosebleed. She had a nosebleed, he said. He then claimed to her that Jessica sat on the bed as he helped Holly control the bleeding from her nose before both girls had then left their home. Refer um, and he also referenced to Maxine one of the 1998 rapes that he had committed, but had earlier claimed to her to have been falsely accused of in the phone call. 
who then began voicing concerns as to again being falsely accused of his involvement on this occasion, also claiming his previous arrest had caused him to suffer a nervous breakdown. So he's blackmailing her emotionally, basically. She had therefore later agreed to conduct, to concoct a false story with her partner to support his version of events. She has to be the dumbest bitch ever. There is, um, and it came out afterwards, and then there's a lot of specials 10 years on, 20 years on, from the Soho murders. They do it like there's a special out uh, England is releasing a like three part mini series called Maxine this year. That's sort of her, his wife's sort of journey, I guess, about it through it all. So, so they were married. I thought they were getting they were, married. No, they were just. Oh, sorry, did I say wife? His partner. Oh, they okay. um, they but accounts have come out where there was extreme physical abuse like where he'd bash the shit out of her. And when you see her in the interview, she can see she looks like a broken woman as well. Mm, mm. Um, and also other counts of um, child molestation and stuff with him. So he's a, an absolute downright scumbag. No excuse, but she's obviously a battered woman. In no this excuse. Situation. No yeah. excuse. After being informed of the discovery of the children's bodies and the evidence of Huntley's guilt, including his fingerprints being recovered from the bin in which the children's clothes had been found, and that the dust and concrete that they'd found in the car was of the same type used to pave the road leading to where the girls' bodies were found. Oh, God. And it was around that wheel arches and on the pedals of his car and shit. Maxine burst into tears, shouting, No, he can't have been. It can't have been him. He hasn't done it. Despite these revelations, she initially remained emotionally attached to Huntley and professed her belief in his innocence to both the police and her family. Huntley's mental state was assessed to determine whether he suffered from any form of mental, mental illness and whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. It was concluded that although psychopathic, Huntley did not suffer from any major mental or psychotic illness and was deemed mentally competent to stand trial. Good. Huntley was charged with two counts of murder, to which he entered a plea of not guilty. Maxine was charged with two counts of assisting an offender and one count of perverting the course of justice. During the trial, it was revealed that on the last day of the friends' lives, and by pure chance, they had happened to pass by Huntley's home at a time when Maxine was not present. Huntley had deliberately lured the girls into his home at a prox and that both girls had been murdered shortly thereafter. With cell site analysis showing Huntley had switched off Jessica's mobile either outside his home or within the grounds of the school after both girls had been murdered. Through mobile phone records and eyewitness accounts, Maxine was placed in Grimsby on the evening in question. And it was also revealed that the site where the two friends' bodies were discovered was a location that Huntley had been known to go to for his plane spotting hobby. Fucking weirdo. Who spots planes for fuck's sake mm. and where he assumed they were unlikely to be discovered they don't sound like the sharpest tools in the shed both of them do uh, they no no bless bless there's her. a few chromosomes missing or something and you wait till you see the pictures of him he's this Ugh. little fucking douche little scumbag due to the extensive state of decomposition of the bodies the coroner had been unable to determine the precise course of death for either mm. child or Close. whether the girls had been sexually assaulted before or after death. But it was most likely that both girls had died of asphyxiation. There was no broken bones. There was no holes in the skull or anything like that. Yeah. During the trial, Huntley admitted both girls had died in his house, but denied that either death had been intentional. Listen to this. He said that the girls had entered his bathroom to stem a mild nosebleed. So I think he'd come up with this nosebleed story because they had the blood traces. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So he said that both girls had entered, entered his bathroom to stem a mild nosebleed Holly had been suffering when the girls walked by his home. The bath was already filled with water as he'd been cleaning his dog that afternoon. In the bathroom, he had slipped and accidentally knocked Holly into his bath while helping her stanch her nosebleed. And this unintentional act had caused her to drown as he panicked and froze. He, he further claimed Jessica had witnessed the accident and began repeatedly screaming, you pushed her. And then he had then accidentally suffocated her while attempting to stifle her screaming, which had preoccupied his attention as opposed to ensuring Holly did not drown. 
By the time his state of panic had waned, it had been too late to save the lives of either children. During this, Maxine has, gets called to the witness stand and she's also turned on him at this stage during the trial and accepts that he was a murderer, calling him out. Question about the efforts she had made to mislead both police and the media to divert suspicion from her partner, Maxine emphasised she'd only lied to the police, the media and anyone who asks to protect Huntley, who had repeatedly assured her of his innocence of any wrongdoing and his fear of being fitted up by the police for the girl's disappearance should they discover the 98 rape allegation made against him. The jury returned a major verdict guilty on two counts of murder against Huntley. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Huntley's face showed no emotion as the verdict was announced. Maxine pleaded guilty to the charge of perverting the course of just justice and not guilty to the charge of assisting the offender. The jury had accepted her insistence that she'd only lied to police and media in order to protect Huntley because prior to their arrest, she had believed his claims of innocence. So she believed she did not know the girls. She claimed she did not know the girls were dead, yeah. that they just entered the premises and she was covering up for them for it because they were there and he didn't want him to be incriminated. But it wasn't until they were bodies were found that she realised they were dead. And when they asked her about what about when you say... Uh, she was just lovely using the girls in past tense. She said, oh, that's because I taught them in the past. But there's also a claim that one woman reckons they saw Huntley and Maxine um, when she came home. He'd lifted the boot of his car and she stood there and was gasped and, like, taken back. And um, they noticed the neighbour watching and he shut the boot of the car really quickly. So there's also talk that they think he'd shown her the bodies. And she yeah. was just like, holy fuck, holy fuck, holy fuck. But the time frame wouldn't really have fitted because they would be able to determine at least a period of death. If she didn't come home till three days after they went missing, mm. if he had gotten rid of the bodies by then, they should yeah. have been able to at least pinpoint that the three days that, that you know, like if she wasn't there. Whether or not the bodies were there or not, how long exactly? The how been long? Like, like within, within, like it's generally like within at least twenty four hours they can pinpoint it. Yeah. You know, like even with them burned and stuff like that, they'd still know based on de decomposition, like how long they'd been deceased for. Oh well, and that's what they're saying. Like when they she would, they were dead in the truck. <laughs> that's what they're assuming. Oh, not just yeah. like blood Tied stains up. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it could have been blood. Yeah, no, I think it was, they were assuming he'd seen, they'd seen the bodies in the back. He'd shown her. So who knows how much she actually did really know. Yeah. Um, so the jury accepted her insistence that she'd only lied to protect the media. We said that, did I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As such, she was not found guilty of assisting an offender. And she was sentenced to serve three and a half years in prison for perverting the course of justice. So she's out now. Well, she since, since being incarcerated, Huntley has been attacked numerous times by inmates, including having scalding water pulled over him, beatings, etc. sucked in cum. Mm. On the 5th of September 2006, Huntley attempted to kill himself in jail, which resulted in his hospitalisation and a thorough search of his cell was conducted where they found a cassette tape. This cassette tape is believed to be what would be his posthumous confession posthumous mm. confession so he recorded the tape went to kill himself that was going to be his last confession confession he claims to have confessed to having murdered both girls to maxine he reckons he told maxine he'd killed the girls prior to their arrest and his plans to confess to authorities to which huntley alleged maxine had slapped him in the face and informed him to pull himself together as she did not wish to lose the teaching position she had learned, yearned for all her life. Huntley further alleges that Maxine had encouraged him to burn the bodies in an attempt to destroy all forensic evidence, linking him to the crime. Well, well if it was domestic violence, that's typical behaviour of someone still trying to bring someone down when they don't have control over them any longer. Boom, that's exactly So that what doesn't really knock another nail in the coffin nah. for me. It could still go either way. I, I say the exact same thing in a couple of sentences. So it's believed that Huntley had agreed to have made this recording for a fellow prisoner who would hope to later sell the confession to the media after his release. Oh, of course. In, in, Dirty return, dog. in return for being provided with the antidepressants that he'd used to attempt suicide. 
So this person had given him the antidepressant stack. Mm. And then he was like, I'll, I, if you get me that, I'll give you a tape so you can sell it. I think the stuff he says about Maxine is bullcrap. It's come to light afterwards through many witnesses how he used to physically abuse the shit out of her. So this would be his last attempt to try and fuck her over for turning against him. But yeah, he's still in prison. And wait, and I mean, I don't want you to wait and see, but when you see the picture of these two beautiful little angels, it's fucking heartbreaking. Oh, my God. I'm totally going to watch the special. Yeah, so that's that. That was awful. Yeah, it's so sad. But it's funny because, like, the police investigation in it is super interesting in the way mm. that they sort of get their intel. No, it's him, like, have a hunch from the very beginning and just have to find the evidence to build the case. But sometimes that can go the other way too. They can get stuck on the hunch and then they try to build the case yeah. around And then he's you know, trying to act the suspect. All, and you see him when he's talking, like, he's unassuming. Like, he doesn't look like someone that would do something like this but it just does look like a little fucking knack of scumbag there was a guy who said he saw them um having a fight well before this before they moved to so um and he was literally had her in a headlock out the front and just punching her <gasps> in the same spot in the head and the guy said to him oi mate rah, 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 and he said something like come up here so he ran up the stairs to stop him and as he pushed him the guy um huntley fell over um, because then the whole time when he was telling him to fuck off, he's still just punching her. She fell on the ground. The guy, um, she he threw her to the ground, went for the guy, and then Huntley got knocked to the ground. And then Maxine jumped up screaming, what have you done to him? What have you done to him? And he, the guy said, you guys deserve each other. And left, which is super sad. Oh. Uh, mm. Not nice. No. Such a Debbie Downer every time we do these episodes, isn't it? I know, but you we, know we're what? both finished and we're like, Do you know what the silver lining is? What? We get to record one episode after this and we get to drink real wine. I know, I'm good. <laughs> luckily, do you know, I nearly didn't buy another bottle of wine. I just went, Oh, because I've got so much shit tomorrow to do tomorrow. I say this every week, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to go. Am I fucking kidding? Seriously. Uh, well, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the last of our season's international true crime special. This is also the last official episode of season four. Thank <laughs> thanks for joining us on our journey this season. We hope you loved it as much as we have. But we, but we aren't done just yet. We will, of course, be doing our annual Christmas special with our beloved partners in life and crime, Tyler and Vinny. Make sure to tune in for that special episode on Tuesday, the 6th of December. Good night, you stupid bitches. But before we say good night, actually. Jingle bells, motherfuckers. Jingle bells, motherfuckers. And also, please be gone, curse of season four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <gasps> Away with you. That's why we're officially ending season four now. It's not going to curse mm. the fucking Christmas episode, I tell Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Good night, you stupid bitches. Good night. Good night. Yeah, that stupid bitch mm -hmm. He's a stupid bitch What a stupid bitch That stupid bitch